This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's <laughs> guest, we've got a legend, James Cosmo. How are you, James? Oh, boy? Great, thanks, James. Pleasure to be here. It's lovely. Ah, no, absolute pleasure to have you on. Like I says, living legend. You've from Scottish kid, Clyde Bank, to then being in the Highlander, Braveheart, yeah. Troy, Sons of Anarchy, Train Spotting 1 and 2, Game of Thrones. The list is long, and those shows, films are absolutely smashed it they're timeless and i still watch some of that stuff today it's unbelievable to have you on first and foremost how are you i'm very well thank you thank god i'm i'm doing great thank you you look great yeah i'm feeling good and you're you're as fucking big as i'd imagined i know i'm a wee bit too big (laughs) (laughs) i was just putting on these trousers this morning i thought geez these trousers have shrunk in the wash or something i know that'd be right but what height are you about six two but i'm going down the way you shrinking? Aye. Old age? I am. I'm shrinking that way and getting bigger that uh-huh. way. A man of many talents. You've also got a new whiskey out, which we'll promote straight away. Aye. Is this your own? My own whiskey with, um, in uh, partnership with Annandale Distilleries mm-hmm. uh, in the Borders, funnily enough. Um, but it's a, you know, very briefly, I, I started off, um, I wanted to, to get a whiskey. Um, you know, when you're doing films or TVs or whatever, and at the end of the show, you want to get people something, you know, right. and you spend hours in bookshops and, you know, trying to think, what can I buy them? And I thought it'd be great to have a bottle of whiskey and just say, that's for me, something special, you know? Mm-hmm. So I'd, I'd met the people at Annandale because they wanted to do a, a, a Outlaw King whiskey. So I helped them uh, in the initial promotion of that. That didn't work out for uh, that whiskey for various reasons, but I met, all the guys up there, David Thompson that, and his wife, uh, Teresa um, Church, that, that owned the distillery and became friendly with them. And so I, I said to my business partner, Andy Pancholi, why don't you um, contact them and see if I could do that? So he did. And it just grew. You know, we realized, hang on, you know, maybe my favorite whiskey might be a lot of people's favorite whiskey. So we worked with um, uh, Keith uh who was the the master blender, uh, Keith Law, and he just he had a really illustrious career as a whiskey blender. You know that nose, mm-hmm. and it took us about eighteen months uh, to two years to develop the whiskey that I really wanted. You know, we'd have we'd have ten whiskeys, and then that'd be down to three, and then Keith would go away and do some more blending and things, and it it was an incredible process. And eventually, we came up with that one and i have to say i I was up in edinburgh a a couple of weeks ago and they they did a blind tasting uh, of six really high-end whiskies but it was a blind tasting and that one won every time it's the most beautiful i don't know how he did it but it's it's just a phenomenon that it's just the most beautiful whiskey 
It's the easiest drinking whiskey. It's lovely. Where can people get it? They can get they can get it online. They can get it from Masters of Malt. And we're just rolling out the distribution in the UK, America, China, all over the place. China. But it's a very fine whiskey. Whiskey's massive in China. It's incredible. Why it's is that? Incredible. I don't know. I think it, it just must, you know... It, ring their bell but the 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 real aficionados of whiskey and there's certainly a, a yeah. terrific market to be in fair play and good luck with it james uh, thank you very much thank you before we get into everything no i would yeah. like to go back to the start of my guests get a bit of understanding about you where uh -huh. you grew up and how it all began okay well i was i was actually born in dumbarton um my dad at the time was a a, a water bailiff uh, on the river leaven and the Loch Lomond the Endrick, all that round there. And that's that's what he was doing. He later became an actor. Uh, but when I was born, he was a water bailiff and uh, we lived in Wallace Street in Dumbarton. Um, and, but very early we moved up to Dalmuir, just at the edge of Clyde Bank there. And um, that's where I did most of my, my uh, growing up, up a close in Clyde Bank, that was me. Uh, and then when I was about, I was, Eight, and my father had, as I said, had become an actor, and he moved down to London. And my mum and dad, they, they'd been apart for quite a long time. Um, anyway, he was down there in London doing whatever he did, and my mum uh, was uh, looking after my sister Laura and myself up in Glasgow, um, in Clyde Bank. And uh, one day, my father sent a letter, or he phoned, or something. And he said, look, he said, I've got this part in this play. It was called Sailor Beware. It was a farce, right? And the, the lead actress was a lady called Peggy Mount. And she was like the biggest name in the West End. Everybody loved Peggy Mount. She was a big, loud sort of woman. Anyway, um, they knew it was going to run for a long time. It ran for three and a half years eventually. So my dad contacted my mum and said, come down to London. Um, so he sent her up some money so we could pay off, you know, whatever debts we had and all that sort of stuff. So my father thought my mum was going to take the, the the train or probably the coach, you know, as you did in those days, all down the A1 to to London. But she didn't. She went out and she bought, the first day, she bought a gypsy bow top wagon, you know, the canvas covered mm -hmm. wagons like that. She bought one of them. And then the next day, she went down to the fish market. Now, the fish market, why? Anyway, she went down to the fish market and she bought a, a horse, a grey called Bobby. And she got the horse and she walked it back home and she put it in the, the, in the traces of the wagon and she piled me, my sister, and her best friend, Elizabeth. And we all headed off down to London in a gypsy wagon. And that took us about six weeks getting down there, <laughs> yeah. all over the place. Takes you know? about six weeks in a car. Aye, if you, if you get stuck in the M6, it does. <laughs> um, but that, that took us six weeks going down there. It was an, an amazing uh, journey uh, for a young boy. And uh, then we lived in London for about three years. Uh, and then I moved, we moved back up for whatever reason. And my mum went to work in uh, the singer's sewing machine factory that was probably the biggest employer in Clyde Bank and uh, I, I went to school and then when I was 15 I realised this isn't working for me <laughs> and uh, I remember I've, I, I forged the use of a, a national insurance card you know that gets stamped and all that sort of stuff and I did a bit of jiggery pokery with the writing and things and changed it so I looked as if I was a year older and uh I worked in pubs and then I worked at uh, Arnett Young's, the Shipbreakers, um, which was like Dickensian. It really was. It was like, you, you know, these Lowry paintings, you know, of these people walking to factories and yeah. things. It was horrible. And I went and I worked there for about less than a year anyway. And I thought, oh God, I can't do this. It's just, you know, this is not life. It's just awful. Um, so then I, I was, I guess I was about 17, something like that. So I, I just buggered off and went to London and thought I'll, I'll go down there and see what happens. What were you like at school? Um, pretty dumb. Pretty, I, I think I just, 
I think people have, in their life have a time when they are open to knowledge and sometimes they're not. And I wasn't. My head was away somewhere else. And I could say that I, I regret not having a, a terrific education, but life took me in a different path and I get educated in different ways. And now in my later years, I'm, you know, I, I've got a huge interest in lots and lots of things. But at that time, I just wanted to be out in the world, you know, like a, a, a life of, of, of studying things. It, it just wasn't for me. It was always... You know, I was in a, a group called the Shifting Sands. I was the lead singer. God, I've seen photographs of it. It's really embarrassing. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was always, I always loved, no, yeah, I loved being out there, doing my thing, enjoying it. You know, I was always a bit outrageous at school. I was the one that dressed a bit funny and, you know, I, I, I was a wee bit different to people that wanted to go on a more acceptable path but I knew that wasn't for me it just I knew it in my bones I couldn't I couldn't do that you know I couldn't go and work in an office I couldn't spend my time in a shipyard I just didn't want it I wanted something something more different. something different yeah you always have that feeling because it's the ones who are kind of creative the ones who sit in school and stare out the window not be asked with books because that it's not a life either the, no. the, the programming from a young age to four to 16 university and following the system yeah it's good to break free from the system because your prime example you've traveled the world you've been in some of the best films ever created like that's what people need to understand just because your grades are shite at school you're sitting doing exams for a few years and that can define people's lives because they don't think they were good enough now you says earlier you are done but you're not because you've clearly succeeded in life people can look to you for inspiration and and go wow how did he do it because like I say, if people are doing exams for three, four hours or a couple of days and getting other results, that ruins people's lives because they don't think they're good enough. Yeah. And that's the yeah. sad reality. Yeah. Did you yeah. always have that inner belief that there was something more out there? Yeah, I, th I thought I'd, that I, uh, you know, the, the hubris of youth, I, th I thought I, I can make a success of this. You know, and the, the one advantage I had was that my father, although he was, he was, he was very much a, you know, a working actor that, you know, he, he did whatever came along. That was it. But I, I, I had the advantage that I knew that a career in acting was, it wasn't all, you know, premiers and, and beautiful women, you know, it was months of not working, of not getting a job, you know? And the one thing I learned was stickability. Keep on going. If that's your dream, if that's what you want to be, just keep on going and do whatever you have to do to keep yourself going. You know, and uh, young actors talk to me sometimes, you know, like, have you got any advice? I haven't got any advice for uh, for anyone about the, the art of acting because it's a very much an instinctual thing with me. You know, that character comes to me subliminally. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't study scripts and, and do research and all that sort of thing. I know that somewhere in the back of my head, my subconscious is is thinking about that and working it out, but I certainly don't, you know. But the one thing I can say to them is that if you're, you know, a, a male or female actor, it doesn't matter, but never think that when, when you're working in a pub or working in the roads, as I did a lot, um, that that's not of benefit to you as a young actor, because it is. It's giving you life experience. It's you watching people. It's seeing how life works how the dynamics of characters work and one day you'll be able to bring that to a performance maybe not a specific situation but that knowledge of how people work how people interact with each other that's really really important and you don't get that in drama school yeah when did you, what was your first ever part it was um <laughs> it was an episode of dr finley's casebook and i played would you believe a choir boy <laughs> um so that that was that was my first part how um, was that feeling it was it was incredibly exciting incredibly exciting and but i i, I couldn't i couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time i was just terrible i was awful and bill simpson who was who played dr findlay it was dr Findlay's casebook was a really it ran for about 15 years i think 
and the actors, the main actors, the regulars in it were Bill Simpson, Andrew Cruikshank, and Barbara Mullen. And it was about a doctor in the 30s, you know, and, and the, a sort of mining village and all that. It's a wonderful, it was a wonderful series. And those three were so kind to me, so generous, you know, and they, you know, they, they sort of guided me along, you know, and, and they were just lovely, lovely people. And, and so that gave me a great, you know, my goodness, I've, I've actually been on television, you know, and four of my mum said, I'm, I've, Mum, I'm, I'm going to be on TV and all that sort of stuff. It how was old, fantastic. How old were you? I was, uh, I, I, I might have, no, I was 17, 17, yeah. So young. Did you see your yeah. dad struggle? Yeah, a lot, a lot. Yeah, I, I used to see him, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I'd, I'd go and see him and he hadn't worked in, six months or whatever and the tax man was after him and just just the anxiety of that you know it was it was it was hard for my dad you know because um you, you know if, if you're a if you're a painter an artist you can go and paint you can be like vincent van gogh and just paint and paint and it doesn't you know your paintings don't sell okay your paintings don't sell but you can still do what you want to do you can still do that thing that drives you on because you need to paint. The same with a musician. If nobody is hiring you, you can still sit in an attic somewhere and play the violin or play the piano or compose something. You can still do it. As an actor, you have to have that whole crowd of people to be there and for someone to give you that job, for you to walk in front of a television camera or a film camera, you need people to do that. And that's, that's the lonely bit because you're at the, the mercy of, of fate. Are you going to be in the right place at the right time? Who knows? And for most actors, most of the time, you're one of the out crowd. You're not in the in crowd. So you've seen your dad struggle. Mm. Did that give you the strength or some sort of inner belief to then stay consistent because you know how hard it was out there? And yeah, gave you a better understanding yeah, of I, the struggle. I, I didn't go in with any illusions, none at <clears> all. I thought this is this is going to be hard, so you're going to have to, you know, when when you get the chance, when it appears, you make the very best of it. Have you always had that presence? So because when you come in, you light up a room. You've got a great energy. Like sometimes when I do interviews, it can be draining. But I feel yeah. good around you. Like a good, oh, that's lovely a good to hear. Presence. Thank you. Have you Thank always you. had that as well? Where You've had the big smile and people go, I like him, because that must go a long way, because you see actors, you see anybody in life, and you go, he's a right fucking wanker. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, but, I do. <laughs> Tell you, me about but it. But you've got that presence where you've got that likability factor. Does that help mm. with being an actor auditions, or is it, does that not come into play? Um, I don't think it can come into play that much because, as you say, there's a lot of people that are out there. You think, "Oh, what a tosser," <laughs> you know. But he's, you know, they're still out mm -hmm. there, you know. Um, but I, I think I, I was, you know, when when you say, "Oh, I was I was born in a, you know, I lived in a tenement in Clyde Bank or whatever," you know, as if, oh, poor you, mm -hmm. you know, you were born, uh, you know, your mum worked in a factory and all that. Poor you, not at all. I had the most privileged upbringing ever. Somebody that was, that was born in a country house and went to Eton didn't have the privilege of my upbringing. They didn't have. Because I lived in a community that was a real, a real community. It was fantastic. We could go out and we, we played in the streets. You could, you could shout for a, a, a jilly piece Somebody would give you something. Some some window would fly open and a, a jelly piece would come flying out the window for you, you know? It was a it was a real community of of hard working people, um and people that um valued uh people that worked, people that, that tried to educate themselves for the sake of education. It was uh it was wonderful, and and I think that instilled in me, and my father and mother instilled in me the the belief that there was nothing wrong in being ordinary and just being a, one of us, you know, no airs or graces, no, uh, I don't have a particularly high opinion of myself. I'm I'm just the same as everyone else. That 
I was lucky and I took advantage of that luck and look what I am, you know, but I've no illusions about myself as a person. How much rejection is it you have to go through to be an actor? Tons, tons. When I was young, you go up for 10 auditions or in those days, you, you often met the, the director to talk through a, a part or whatever. So you, you would do that and you'd go away and, you know, you'd wait for the phone call from your agent or whatever doesn't come doesn't come and then you'd phone your agent and they say oh no no that didn't happen you know and that's like it, it is a you, you know it, maybe you maybe you were too tall too short too fat too slim wrong color whatever it, that does, doesn't matter it's a rejection for you you know like you you feel i wasn't good enough and that's a tough one to keep on keeping on mm -hmm. but you've just got to have belief in yourself and say well whatever Lots of people don't get chosen, but one day I will. What was your first big breakthrough? It was um, a film called The Battle of Britain. And I'd just turned 18 and uh, I went up to, to meet them. And uh, it was an American guy that, that it wasn't the director, uh, Guy Hamilton, but casting director or something. And uh, they cast me in that as uh, flying officer, Jamie. Um, and... Uh, I was all the way through the movie, you know, and it was fantastic. It was like, it was like a dream. I can't tell you, James. It was like, you know, we were on these airfields and hurricanes and spitfires were flying around. And I got to meet guys that had actually been in the Battle of Britain. I used to drink with a, a guy called Ginger Lacey, who was a British air ace. And um, he must have been, I thought he was really old. He must have been in his maybe late 60s or something, you know, which is a youngster to me now. But um, uh, we, we used to drink together. We, for some reason, we became friends, you know. And I spent a lot of time with him and he told me lots of stories, some funny ones, some tragic, horrible ones. Um, but it was just amazing to meet people like that. And it was a long, hot summer, the same as the Battle of Britain. Mm -hmm. And I met so many famous people i was when i did my first scene they uh, they called me and i'd been waiting around for about four weeks and i'd get used to just sitting out and getting dressed and sitting out in the sun and at the end of lunchtime they come up and say you're not going to be used and I'd, I'd go off and that was me and then one day they said uh, you'll be on set in half an hour and oh jesus and uh, it was with christopher Plummer, um the late christopher Plummer, and so it with all these things happening in the background and troop convoys and planes and they were on radios, right, ready to go, ready to go. And I'm getting more and more nervous. I'm thinking, oh dear God, if I screw this up, you know, they're going to have to write everyone back to number ones, you know, it's going to take all day. Anyway, we got through it and I was, it was just before lunchtime and I was walking back to the, the coach to take us the, 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 the lunch place. And, uh, this I always remember it was a, a a long wheelbase white Mercedes convertible with red leather upholstery like whoa the bollocks it was beautiful and Christopher Plummer's sitting in the back like this and he said uh, James he said where are, you, where are you going I said oh the one of the assistant directors said I have to go on the coach to go back for lunch and he said get in here I said no he, he said I have to go he said get in the car and I got in the car with him. We drove round, not to the lunch place, but we drove round and there was a, a lovely marquee, small marquee set out. And he said, come and have lunch. And I was like, this is Christopher Plummer. You know, like, what? And I walked in and it was, that was the, the, the catering place for all the big names, you know, and Michael Caine sitting there, Trevor Howard sitting there, Robert Shaw was there. It was just like, I can't believe this. I just can't believe it. It was fantastic. What was Michael Caine like? He was lovely. He was very nice. We get, we drove in the car to some location or whatever before we did something. And he was he was ever so nice. I don't know if he said, my name's Michael Caine. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to think he might have done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was a legend then. He's a legend as well. He He's certainly lovely. is. He yeah. certainly is. Yeah. Did you look up to any actors and, and try and inspire to be like them or were you on your own journey where you wanted to just be you yeah i was i, I, I was on my journey um i mean I've, I've learned a huge amount from actors that i've worked with 
you know, in the past and, and now you're always, you're always learning. Um, but uh, I, th I think not not so much in the actual performance, you know, as, as I was saying before, that's more an instinctual thing with me, you know, and if, 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 if that's how I play it, that's, that's how I play it. I'm not trying to be anything else or take anything. It's, it's just what comes out. Um, but things that I have learned, you know, like um, trying to be as professional as you can be, you know, like never give anyone an excuse to th to think that you weren't doing the very best you could you know like i'm i'm sort of i shouldn't say proud but i'm i'm uh, happy to say that i've never been late for anything ever because there's no excuse in the industry for being late you know the the easiest thing in the world is to be on time be there and be ready that's yeah, that's important to me. See when the, you're getting called back and you're getting you're moving through the ranks, when was that moment you realised I'm doing it? You're feeling as if you're doing your passion. Did that ever did that come at a young age? Because you were getting these parts 17, 18, you you were kinda young when you started off. Was there a moment where you thought, okay, this is it? I think I'm still waiting for that <laughs> moment. <laughs> when you know I still think I'm kidding on. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that is what we were talking about earlier. You know, you think, you know, I'm just me. Imposter you know, what, what, syndrome. Imposter syndrome, absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just me. What people think I am, it's it's not really true. When did the Highlander come? Was that 1986? Ah, something like that, yeah. Because yeah. that was a massive movie. Was that one of the biggest you'd done in your career? Well, at, I, at I, wasn't in, I wasn't in it that much, but um, the the great thing was that, that Highlander, it, it really... Um, broke the mold a little bit, you know, because Russell Mulcahy, the director, had come from uh, pop videos, mainly. That's, that's what he did. And so he brought that whole idea of the camera moving, you know, because in a pop video, you've got, what, three minutes to, to uh, well, the atmosphere has got to be there, bang, like mm -hmm. that. And so he was used to that camera moving and then Queen's music as well you know it was just something else and it was it was a terrific experience mm. to be involved in that what about Braveheart what was it when what was it how did you get into that film um well I was um uh my son Ethan who's just sitting there um uh he had just been born and my wife and I my wife Annie and I I'd, I'd been out of work for a wee bit and we were staying in this uh one bedroom apartment in Twickenham. It was a nice one bedroom apartment, but we we didn't have any furniture. So we'd borrowed a, a sort of rocking chair from Annie's mum and there was a, a TV and we'd a foot on, um, you know, one of these Japanese beds in the in the bedroom. And Ethan slept in that, as we did, because I always believed that children should sleep with you. That's just one of my things until they don't want to sleep with you i think that's natural anyway um he was he was there and it was a i met mel gibson about <clears throat> four five months before for a, a general meeting you know i'd gone up to meet him and uh i remember he he, he said uh hey uh i'm mel gibson uh, he said uh, do you want a drink yeah i know that he doesn't drink or he didn't and I said, oh, hi, certainly, you know. So he poured me a dram and we sat and he said, uh, what, do you, what do you think about this music uh, for his, like a Scottish film? And he played some sort of harp stuff, you know, and we spoke about that for literally five minutes and then I was gone. So that was like, you know, okay, maybe one day or probably not. Anyway, it was out of my head. So it was Saturday night and... Uh, the treat of the week that Annie and I had was a carry out curry, right? I'm a big curry fan. I love cu I'm from Glasgow. Of yeah. course I love curry. <laughs> um, but uh, we had a carry out curry and there, there was no stream. Uh, maybe there was um, blockbusters or whatever you call it. You know, we got a film in and it was 20 to 11 Saturday night. The curry had come at half past 10. So it was all red. I was like, oh, jeez, I'm starving. And uh, uh, we're just about to watch this film. So the phone rings. I thought, yeah, fuck it. I, so I said to Annie, if that's my, my best pal was a guy called Dominic, Dominic Burke, 
God rest his soul. Um, but I thought it was Dominic calling from the old Anchor pub to see if I'd come up, come, come for a, a late pint, you know, the last pint. I said, that'll be Dominic. I said, just say, I'll, I'll, I'll see him tomorrow at lunchtime, but I just want to have my curry, you know. So Annie said, yeah, she's sure. And she lifts the phone and, uh, you know, it's like a house phone. And she says, uh, hello, like that. I says, yes. All uh, right, uh, would you just hang on? I said, I'm going to be in my fucking curry. Don't. And she went, she said, it's, it's Mel Gibson. I went, oh, don't be so, for fuck's sake. That's that Dominic. He, he was a terrible practical joker, I said, was he? And she put the phone down and she went into the kitchenette and shut the door. I thought, what are you doing? Anyway, I lifted the phone. I said, hello, like that. And he, this voice said, uh, hey, Jimmy, it's, it's Mel. I went, oh, I, who is it? And he went, uh, it's Mel, uh, Mel Gibson. And I went, fuck. I went, ah, hi, uh, Mel. <laughs> and he said, hi, hi. He said, uh, I've been watching, uh, your showreel. Uh, and he said, uh, the character of Campbell, you know, the, the father. Uh, I went, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, I, I'd love you to play the father. You know, you've got to play old, and uh, but then when he's young, you know. Uh, and I went, oh, right. He said, would, would you like to play Campbell? And I said, uh, yeah, I'd love to, Mel. He went, oh, great. He said, uh, I'm coming over. I'll uh, see you next week. Goodbye. I put down the phone like that. And I, always, I, always, I remember we had a clock in the house. I looked at the clock, it said 20 to 11. And I thought, boy, this changes everything. That was it. Did you know? Did you have that feeling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that when I read the script. When, you know, yeah, yeah. One of the, greatest, one of the greatest films of all time. Obviously, yeah, yeah. The bias because I'm maybe Scottish, but... It was just everything about it. The actors, the Mad Irish being a hara. Like, David O'Hara. He's what, a mad fantastic. bastard, mate. I love him. Fantastic. It, it just, and, the and he's a lovely, well. lovely guy. He's David. a great, great I friend of David, mine. Yeah. yeah. And uh, just, it just seemed to make sense. It yeah. just, from, and I've watched it fucking hundreds of times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I get my kids to watch it. And Do you? Ah, so, yeah. uh, great. <laughs> it's, uh, but, see when you were, how long were you out acting before that call? Uh, about uh, six months or so. Was there any, any moments where you thought about giving up before that call because of the sun coming and no money and struggling? Nah. Do you always no. believe? No, because I, I was, at, at the time, I was, um, uh, had a friend of mine, Ian Black, um, who had gone to Clydebank High School, but he was, he, was a, he, was, he was a tough fucker. He was a real, he was a bit of a lad, but he was very smart as well. And he'd... Uh, gone into I think he worked for Heinz and then he went into pharmaceuticals generic pharmaceuticals and he'd done ever so well and he was running a company out in Harlow and we were in contact and things and I think I said geez you know I'm struggling a bit he said well, well he said come and work for me just as security he said but I'm going to put you in as um like if we're losing any pharmaceuticals this guy's under anyway he was he was just bunging me a few extra quid so i was used to get up in the morning and drive around the m25 to the m11 and then up to harlow it took about an hour and three quarters every day but i'd drive up there but i was get i was getting money you know like i say i don't didn't care i still wouldn't care what what i had to do to put food on the table so no i i knew you know, I'd been out of work for a while, but I was still earning money. I was still not, I don't mm -hmm. believe in taking anything that you, you know, take anything from the state. Um, I'll go out and earn my own money. Um, so I was okay, but I, I, I'd never had the, even the inkling of the idea that I'd give up. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to give up. Of course I wasn't. See, when you got the script, did, did you know that Mel was going to play? Yeah. Did you know? Yeah. What, what were you thinking then? Well, the, the reason behind that was that Mel wanted, he said that he'd read the script, because it had been around for two or three years, you know, doing the rounds of the studios in LA, and uh, uh, no one had picked up on it. Mel had read it and thought, yeah, it's an yeah, interesting sort of idea and all that sort of thing. Um, but then he said something, he, he just thought, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to direct this. But he really 
just wanted to direct it. But the, he went to the studios to get the money, which was, I think it was about 84 million, which was a, a pile of dough in those days. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the one thing they said was, well, yeah, you can direct it, but you've got a star in it because that sort of guarantees that they'll make their money. Um, so that was why Mel played it, you know, that he was going to play Wallace. How was that for him to direct, act, tough. produce, just do everything? Really tough. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember seeing him when we were doing some ADR just shortly afterwards, and he was just wrecked. He was completely exhausted because he'd, he'd, he'd put everything into that movie. You mm. know, he, he ran just about everywhere, you know. <laughs> he'd jump on the horse, do a bit run back, look at the monitor, boom, back on, back on again. Just, you know, like long, long days. And he was right, because, you know, Wallace is in just about every scene of the film, you know, mm -hmm. and he, tremendous energy. Um, but yeah, it was a, an amazing effort. And, and wonderful, I think it was wonderfully directed. Although he was very wise, um, because he got <clears throat> the DP, the di director of photography, was a guy called John Tall who was like, this guy has won about three Oscars already, you know? So he's, he's got the best cinematographer in the film industry. And then his master stroke was, um, he employed a guy called David Tomlin, who was a first assistant director. And I had known Dave for yonks before that, many, many years. And he was, um, he was the best first assistant in the world. You know, he'd been first assistant on Gandhi, uh, Indiana Jones, all those. He, he could cope with that. And so to have that team behind him, Mel had made a really wise decision, you know, because if you look at a scene and you say to a guy that's won three Oscars, how do you think we should shoot this? Well, you would take his advice, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. And so that was a that was a really good move. But the one thing that I that stuck out with me with Mel was that because he's he, he is an actor, that he understood the process of acting and the anxieties of actors. It's quite intimidating to be on a set where you've got three thousand extras, uh, you've got I don't know two, three, four hundred horses. You've got all that going on. It's like, you know, it's a huge movie. And then the camera comes in on you. That's a bit intimidating. So the, for example, when we were doing my death scene, um, it was just after lunch and they said, you know, and it's a, like a, it's a, an emotional scene for myself and for uh, Brendan Gleeson that's playing my son, you know, old Campbell's been, chopped with an axe and he's he's fading away but he wants to pass this message on to to his son and to wallace and all that sort of stuff so it's a big big sort of scene big emotional scene and we were walking mel and i were walking to the set and he said uh, jimmy he said uh, can you tell me the cheapest thing on this set i said the cheapest thing when uh, now i've got no idea and he said the film and that camera, use as much as you like. And of course that means if I want to sit there all afternoon and do that scene 24 times, as some people have done, that was fine. That was fine with him. That afternoon was written off to do that scene. That's fine. You just carry on. No and pressure. of course, there's no pressure. And of course you relax <clears throat> and you do it in three takes, boom, boom, all done. That's it. But that psychology of a director knowing um, the, the, the pressure that an actor is under, mm -hmm. you know, especially someone who isn't, who isn't a big star or whatever, he's just an ordinary guy, you know, yeah, that's a lot of pressure. Let's take it off. And I remember David Lean, who did, you know, um, Lawrence of Arabia and all those fabulous films, um, he had the same thing. He said, my, my, my most important job is to make those actors feel comfortable in that space that they're in. Mm -hmm. What yeah. about the makeup and that? Because the makeup and that was brilliant. How long did it take to get your makeup and stuff on? It was the I can't I can't remember the makeup man's name. He was a lovely guy and he had an Australian hairdresser um 
who was a, a guy again who was who was very funny. We used to have it was great in the morning, you know, because you'd you'd put your costume in and you'd come on if it was a battle scene, they would be putting on the blue stuff and all that and my my wig and things. But um I remember that the the hairdresser, whatever he's Paul, I think he's uh, Paul. Um when I first went there, he said, uh, James, I'm gonna have to cut your hair, you know, uh, for the wig and things. And I went, yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. He was a bit sort of frantic, you know. I went, yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool, you know. And uh, so you know that way that old-fashioned barbers used to do the scissors. Mm -hmm. They'd be going click, click, like that, and he's got the hair like that. But he's talking away to people. And he's going, yeah, well, guy, tonight, like that. And I'm thinking, for fuck's sake, you know, <laughs> like, pay attention to what you're doing. And he's going, oh, yeah, that'd be lovely, yeah. And shall we do that? And he's doing this. And then this big clod of red hair drops my lap. And I jumped up and went, for fuck's sake, what the fuck have you done? Of course, he had got a, a big hank of costume hair like that. He was winding <laughs> me up like that. <laughs> so he got me like a kipper. Uh -huh. it's, uh, um, so that was that was always mm -hmm. great fun. Yeah. Did you have to learn to ride the horses? Oh well, I, I had ridden horses in, in different shows before, but Braveheart was um, uh, the one. Um, Tony Smart was the, the horse master, and I, I love horses. I've got a, a, a deep and abiding respect for them. I think they're beautiful animals, and um, I went up to Tony Smart's and in uh, just outside London. And uh, he's, they brought the horses over from Spain. They were all film horses, which meant that the Spanish film horses are fantastic. You know, they're bomb proof. They're very biddable. You know, they're just beautiful. And they said, this is, this is your horse. He's, he's called Orochitas, which means little ear. He was a chestnut with a white blaze. And he was, James, he was like a Ferrari, you know, like you'd get on him. And all you had to do was squeeze, just ask like that. And he, he didn't trot, um, but he'd, he'd, he'd just walk and then you squeeze and he'd just go into a really gentle canter. And you squeeze him again, they'd go into a faster canter, squeeze him a wee bit more and he'd just gallop. And then no matter where it was, you just lift your hands like that in the reins and he would just sort of four wheel braking. And he just made sure you were safe. He was the best horse I'd ever mm -hmm. ridden. And I became really, really fond of him. See the freedom scene when they done the speech? Yeah. Did you know how powerful that would be? Um, not before we saw it, because we were standing beside the camera watching it. And it was just, uh, hairs in the back of your neck stood up, you know. It, how, was, it was magnificent. How many takes did that go? I think he only did about three takes on it and different angles as well so yeah it was it was amazing you know and it, it, it sort of makes you think of that henry the fifth <clears throat> speech you know um you know we happy band and all that you know um it's amazing but i've, I've got a, i've got a theory about why braveheart was so popular all around the world you know you you would think it was a film of it uh people fighting for the independence of scotland which it was but the main core, the main drive of that film is about something that I care deeply about, and that's individual freedom. And I think when, when he talks about that, that we will not be cowed by bigger entities than us, that freedom is the most important thing. It's the most valuable thing that each and every one of us have, and that needs to be protected. And I think that had resonance all around the world, in every country, where people said, yeah, yeah, being free is the most important thing we have. Yeah, see when they came out and started showing their ass and their willies and that, was that planned? Oh, yes. From the start? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it portrayed the Scottish as Scottish, just mad bastards who don't bend or break and willing to fight anybody, yeah. no matter what it takes, if they believe in something yeah. in it. And that's it. Listen, Mel, for an American, he played the fucking part brilliant. Absolutely. He played a, an amazing yeah. part. Who that, else could have played it? Yeah. Who else? I can't think Did of it. Did they have anybody else's name in mind? No, I don't think so. No. 
it was Mel Gibson's film from start to finish. And I agree with you. I th you know, like there might be people that say, oh, his accent, well, his accent was great. And you've, you've, you've got to remember that if there was any slight, which I never spotted really, but you know, um, the, the only critics are a few people in Scotland. The rest of the world go, yeah, it's, it's, it's the character that matters. It's not particularly, you know, was it pitch perfect in every degree? It's, it's the character that he played. The music. And he did, he did it beautifully. Yeah. And the music. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. I still yeah. listen to the music when I'm out oh, running at the yeah. gym and I still yeah. get the shivers on my back. Yeah, you do. It makes me want to go and fight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you know, know what? <laughs> I'll tell you, when we went up, um, it, it's, it's a story anyway. Um, story man I um, I was when they, when they were having the premiere of Braveheart it was in Stirling at the McRoberts Centre um, and then the party was at uh, Stirling Castle and I was shooting this film called um, Emma down in the West Country uh, so uh, at a sort of couple of weeks they'd, they'd said oh the premiere's on, on the Sunday and uh, oh god! So I got in touch with my agent and said, "Listen, I've, I really want to be at the, the premiere, you know." And so she said she was talking to the production team at Emma, and they said, "Oh, we've we've, we've booked in this um, uh, it's a scene in the strawberry fields, and you're right in the middle of it, and it's all been booked, and we can't change it and things." Ah, oh, jeez, you know, I'm not, I can't go. So, oh man. And I phoned Annie, my wife, and, and said, look, it's, it's not going to happen, you know, we're not going to get there. And she was great, you know, she said, oh, well, that's the business, I suppose, you know. So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, bollocks to this, you know. And I was doing okay at the time, you know, and because, uh, uh, you know, I get well paid from Braveheart and things. And uh, I said, no, bollocks. So I phoned Annie again, I said, um, book a private plane to fly us up to Glasgow. The car can pick us up from Glasgow and take us to the Premier. And then, well, the same plane has to wait at Glasgow Airport and we'll fly back to, to uh, uh, Fair Oaks. We'll fly back there to this little airport and then I, I'll get driven down to start filming in the Monday morning. I just said, you can't do that. What if anything? I said, no, we'll just fucking do it. You know, and if I, if I can't, well, I've fucked up, you know, but I'm, I'm going to go to that premiere. Anyway, we go to the premiere and that is something else. We like Sterling. It's never, they've never seen anything like it. James, there was like four deep in the streets, people just going nuts, you know, and I'm thinking, I'd never been to anything like that. Like, what is going on here? You know, and we're going up, we get out the cars and people are, oh, it's amazing. So we go in and the mill's there and everybody's there and uh, the lights go down and the film starts. So we watch the film. The lights come up at the end uh, and all the great and the good from Scotland are there. You know, all the f sports stars, the politicians, everybody and anybody that's well known is there. And I look round not one of them wasn't crying. Not one of them. They're all in tears. It was just like, holy shit. It was amazing. So then we go to Stirling Castle and we have this amazing after show party. There's, because it's all themed on medieval stuff. So they've got ox roasts and they've got jugglers and fire, you know, people that do stuff with fire and all that sort of stuff and acrobats and all that. It's got, everywhere the whole castle it's just unbelievable so it comes to like one in the morning and i'm half squiffed by this time <laughs> and uh and he says we've got it i have to go i went right say cheerio to mel so i go over say cheerio find mel say cheerio and we get in the car and we're driving back to glasgow airport and i'm thinking that was great it was terrific and the driver is long before mobile phones and things, but the driver's got one of these phones in the car, you know, the big bricks mm -hmm. that used to be. And she's got one of them. So we're driving back and I'm feeling great. You know, this is good. It's all working out. And the phone rings and the guy lifts it. And he says, oh, he said, uh, he says, it's for you. I went, who's died? You know, like what's happening here? So I uh, lifted the phone and uh, 
this guy says, oh, it's some um, Strathclyde police here. I went, oh, what? He said, uh, it's okay. He said, um, do you have a, a plane leaving Glasgow Airport now? And I said, yeah. I said, well, about half an hour away or 40 minutes away. He went, right. He said, um, would you be willing to transport a human heart down to London? It said, for a transplant. And the time is, you know, in those days it was like really time was of the essence, you know. And I said, yeah, aye, yeah, sure, sure. And uh, he went, right, okay, just stay on the, the motorway or whatever we were. And uh, about five minutes later, two police motorcycles, blue lights, like, whoa, it's like something beside us, you know. And then this ambulance pulled in behind us. And the guy went, the cop went, off we went to Glasgow Airport, never so fast in your life, pulled straight onto the tarmac. The plane had been, the guy, the pilot had been sort of heads up. He had the engines running and things. We got straight on, gone. And we were down in about an hour and a half or whatever it was, landed. There was an ambulance, there were police outriders, and this big yellow, Annie and I sat, and there was this big yellow, like a cool back, you know, a cool chill back box uh, in between us with some poor soul's heart in it. And uh, we landed and the box got taken away, phew, gone. And I often think if I hadn't said, no bollocks, I'm going to go to that, that um, premiere, well, maybe someone wouldn't have got the heart in time. Did you ever find out who it was? No. no. What no. a story that would have been, wasn't it? Because you weren't yeah. going to go and then you've saved some cunt's life. Yeah, yeah. They might hate the Scottish as well. You, you never know. know. <laughs> so <you start laughs> saved his life. I'm mad. Yeah. The fucking yeah, phone shot me and threw him off a heart. Mm. I wonder yeah. whose heart that was. That I know. Unbelievable to find that out. Yeah. Yeah. But you just think, well, that isn't that interesting that fate goes, no, that that heart needs to be there. That Everything happens you know. for a reason. Yeah, yeah, it does. See Absolutely a couple of does. the scenes in Braveheart when they're talking about making the spears. We'll uh, make the spears yeah, yeah. longer than men. Yeah. And somebody says, but some men are longer than <laughs> yeah, others. And you yeah. say, has your mother been spreading stories <laughs> yeah. about me, son? Yeah. Well, that, was that all scripted? He knows every line this time. <laughs> <laughs> is that fucking that's a classic? Is that, was that all planned? Was that all scripted? Yeah, that was scripted, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about when Ahara came as well? And he, he says, I think you, he pulls a knife out on you and you say to him, um, you're a madman. And he fucking says, I've came to the right place and every cunt starts <laughs> laughing. He played he he played a fucking phenomenal oh, part of the fantastic. mad Irishman. Fantastic. I tell you, David O'Hara, when when he's on song, my goodness, there's, there's not many better actors than him. He is extraordinary. He was in the departed and that yeah. and it's unbelievable. So yeah. after break, did you realize But you know, the, the one like we are talking about uh -huh. sort of key lines in the film. Do you remember the one for the the my character gets shot in the chest with the mm -hmm. arrow mm -hmm. and they're all going, oh, I'm not going to take poker. it at them, you know? Yeah, the, yeah. the hot poker bit, you know? So Mel, it was, we were filming at night and Mel said, um, uh, he said, uh, hey, hey, Jimmy, uh, what would you say if uh, someone pulled a fucking arrow out of your chest, you know? I said, that'll wake you up in the morning, boy. <laughs> he went, use it, absolutely. <laughs> so I, I wrote that line. Uh -huh. Although I never get paid for it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Again, because they'd pass the hot poker stick to somebody else to fucking right, stab yeah. you in the yeah. heart. Yeah. And you've punched the cunt. <laughs> 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 what a fellow man. And it deserved every fucking attribute. It deserved every award that got him. I, the Oscar did I, I, end I, I up winning. I was just about to Nine, ask you. Think, something like that. Something crazy. Did you yeah. go to the Oscars? No, no, it's not my thing. Did you get asked? I think I did, yeah. Yeah. See, so after that film, did that change the game for you? Oh, yes. Yeah, it does. Because, you know, like like the film industry, is it's a bit sort of simplistic, you know. If you've been in a big film, then your sort of rating goes up a wee bit higher and people think, well, if we hire him who's been in a success and him, that'll make our film a success. It's mm -hmm. just, yeah. But then, but it, it just that's the way yeah, it works. But then train spotting. That yeah. must have been, was that a couple of years later? Yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. another mega film. Yeah, I'd worked with um, Danny Boyle on a... He had been the head of BBC drama in Northern Ireland and he'd done this, um, it was a really good, I think it was called like Play for Today or something like that, but it was it was called The Night Watch, you know, the same as the, the big mm -hmm. uh, Rembrandt painting. And it was about these mercenaries who were waiting 
in Amsterdam to go to Africa and then it all turns to shit and there's a big, you know, bloodshed and all that sort of stuff. So I was playing one of the mercenaries and, and Danny directed it. And so I'd worked with Danny before and I knew, you know, what a stellar director he was, you know, something else. So when he, he phoned and, and said, I want you to meet whatever the producer's name was of, of train spotting, I went along and yeah, that was that was it. I wanted to play Renton's dad. Did you know back then how good Danny Boyle was as yeah, a director? Yeah. You can, t <clears throat> you, you know, you can usually tell in the first day when you're on a set with somebody if they're if they're okay, and you can also tell if they're absolutely stellar. And he was because I know Arvin well. She's a good friend, and he wrote the book. And see when you got the script for it, yeah. did you know again that it was going to be as big as what it was? No, no, I, I didn't know if a film like that would would. Um, would um, translate to the American audience and, and the greater English audience, really, you know. Because but, of the accent? Yeah, because of the accent, because of the the um, the, the, the social group that, it, that it, it was about, you know. You think, you, you would think maybe, well, maybe this film would, it would do well as a, an art house film, um, you know, it'd be of interest to people that were really into movies and all that sort of thing. But will it, will it be a, a huge mega success? No, nah, probably not. It bloody was. And that was mainly due to, to Danny. All the boys. That and, kicked, and the script, of All course. the boys that kicked on from that. Ewan McGregor. My Bob, goodness. Bobby yeah. Carlyle. Yeah. Every, everyone ended up Hollywood actors. Uh, they did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How was Bobby to work with Carlyle? Oh, he's fabulous. He was, what a part he played. Aye. Oh, <clears throat> Standout, standout parts. Mad bastard. Oh, absolutely. Do you know these guys? I uh, know people like that. Oh, oh fuck, I. <laughs> he must have known people like that. Of course he does. played that part. Yeah, yeah. Because he played yeah. it to perfection. He did, I. But everybody made it. Again, do you feel that? There's not one just carries a film that there's got to be yeah. that team effort? Yeah, yeah. There's a, you know, one one should never think that, um, you know, that, that, my character or my performance is the one that's going to make the film. If you're not backed up by everyone, that's that's why you should always appreciate someone in the same movie as you or the same scene as you being absolutely terrific. You should never feel threatened by that. You should feel grateful for that because he's going to make you look great. Mm -hmm. You know, to work with someone that's a truly wonderful actor is it's a great privilege and, and sh you know, you should never feel um, that he's a danger to you or he's stealing the scene or whatever. Nah, not at all. Let them get on with it. Is this when you felt your career was, it made sense for everything that you've done through the years, the working, not working, and then yeah. was that your, you kind of thought, okay, this is it? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was certainly a, a, a huge high point in my career. It was, it was amazing. And I knew that, that it would have, you know, you're saying about train spotting. I knew that. Uh, I remember sitting with Randall Wallace, who wrote the movie, and we were sitting in Neary's Bar in Dublin because most of it was shot in, in uh, just outside Dublin on the Curra and all that, all the battle scenes, because we had three thousand of the Irish Territorial Army. That's who the extras were, mm. who were fantastic, um, really wonderful. Um, but I was sitting with Randall, and I remember saying to him. I think this is going to have a huge effect on politics in Scotland and, and Britain. And he went, nah, it's, it's just a movie. I said, I don't think so. And I think I was right. You know, for good or bad, I think I was right. Mm -hmm. What was Troy to work on? It was, it was, great, it was great fun. Um, that was a big blockbuster as well. Eh? Yeah, we filmed in, uh, in uh, Malta and then we all went over to... Uh, Baja California, which is just over the border mm -hmm. into Mexico. And it was nice then. I believe you you get shot every day down there now, you know, drug it's cartels. Perfect. Things, you know? <laughs> but in those days, it was okay. And uh, um, Ethan, my son, and uh, just one son at that time, and uh, they flew over. So he spent the whole of his school holidays in this luxurious complex and things. And it, it, was, it was fantastic. What was Brad Pitt like? He's... Uh, I didn't have spent a lot of time with him, but he, he, he we had a couple of evenings and uh, he was delightful, absolutely delightful. And his family, who his sister and his mum were there uh, and they were 
like really ordinary folk, you know, and and uh, yeah, it was it was wonderful. But the the one of the loveliest things was that um, Peter O'Toole obviously was in it, and he was quite elderly at the time, and uh, I had met him when I was, you know, when I spoke about being down in London between eight and eleven, and uh, I used to hang about with my dad sometimes. And he used to drink with Peter uh, in the, it was a pub in Hampstead. I think it might have been called The Flask, I think. But it was just opposite, he had this beautiful big house in Hampstead. He and Shan, what's her name, lived there. And so I used to get my dad, give me a ginger beer and a packet of crisps and I'd sit outside while they get plastered inside. And uh, so I I'd, I'd sort of met him when I was a wee boy. Anyway, um, one of the makeup guys, um, on the on the show had said to Peter, he said, um, do you know his father was an actor? Anyway, so Peter says to me one day, he said, You know, you know, James, he said, uh, I I can't stand American television. He said, it's such bollocks, you know. He said, So my son sends me uh videos of uh, my favorite programs. And I went, Oh, that's a good idea. I thought, where's this going? you know? And he said, Well, he said, Last night, he said, I was watching one of my favorite, you know, I love this, but it's called Dad's Army. I went, oh, yeah, Dad's Army, yeah. He said, well, he said, I was watching an episode last night, he said, and uh, uh, you'd never guess who was on it, who was a guest actor on it. And I went, uh, what, my dad? And he said, yes, your dad. And I cried and cried and cried. I thought that was lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was nice. These were real good pals. Yeah. Oh, were they? Yeah. Yeah. My dad had passed away. You know, oh, sorry to hear that. Yeah. Was Colin Farrow in that film? No, he wasn't. No. Orlando Bloom, was it? Orlando was in it. Orlando, wasn't it? Another guy I... with the black hair, I'm thinking. He's Eric bro Banner. His brother. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some big actors in that, again. I, know. I used to have a lot of fun, because you know the costumes you used to wear? Mm -hmm. um, this leather skirt and things, and all these guys playing big, Heroes, you know, and swords, a mm -hmm. tough guy, you know. I used to stand behind them and just pull the hairs out the back of their legs. And they'd go, oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was great. Uh -huh. I think Orlando was a bit fear of me, <laughs> pulling hairs out of his legs. Yeah. Because he ended up working on Game of Thrones, which I think is the most watched TV show of all time. Must, well, must be up there, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Because I was, I was doing Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. You, before that, and I just I jumped straight from Sons of Anarchy to flew over to Belfast to do Game of Thrones. Two mega shows. What's the yeah. difference from the film scene to the shows? Do you find it better doing the shows because it's longer income, more money, and more time, or is it better doing the films? I, I think um, the the big TV shows like uh, Game of Thrones they have that ability to really go into storylines and things. In fact, they're quite happy to do that because it, it stretches it out and it, there's more income made there, you know? Um, and you can, you get a better chance to develop characters, you know, mm -hmm. making a movie, even if it's two and a half, three hours, you've only got that to tell the whole story. Boom, that's it done. And that's a really, it's a real art form to be able to do that. But when you're, when you're, when you're in a big long running show it's it's pretty cool to do that you know to to work for eight months on a series you mm -hmm. know what was sons anarchy like it, well, it was great that looked Al although, as well. although i thought my my agent phoned and said they want you to come over and do a season of sons of anarchy mm -hmm. what do you think of first thing sons of anarchy right you think tattoos cool bald head absolutely Harley Davidson, yes, I'm up for it. What do I end up playing? A priest. <laughs> I've got a priest. <laughs> That's all I got mm -hmm. out of the fucking thing. Mm -hmm. But he was a great character. Great, to play. A great character. Because he was, you know, yeah. like, he, he was a man of God, but he was also the head of the IRA. People mm -hmm. killed, all that sort of stuff. So I really enjoyed it. And I loved working with them, uh, Charlie Hunnam and uh, uh, Ron Perlman. They were great guys. And of course, um, Tommy Flanagan, old Chibs was in it mm -hmm. from Braveheart. I know Tommy. Yeah. Oh, he's a, 
an old Another friend. Another great man. actor from Milton, Glasgow. I speak to him a few times, I think he's in America then now. Yeah. Uh, he's coming on the podcast, he was supposed to come on a couple of years back, but all the lockdown shit, he couldn't get yeah, out. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 Another great actor. He's Again, he, great was guy. he not in Troy? Yeah. I was a gladiator. No, I was a gladiator. gladiator. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you feel as if you were getting picked for those roles? Kind of mad bastard, kind oh, of violent do. swords? You do sort of, mm-hmm. you know, like you, whatever you, yeah, any any actor, you tend to get corralled you know if if you're a, especially if you're you're if you're playing a character in a, a sort of medieval swords and sandals and horses and all that well the next time they make a sword and sandal and horses film they're, they're going to look at you right away you know so you tend to go down that route mm-hmm. but as i've got older you know i think i you know he surely can't be a a warrior at that age although that's not true game of thrones as well like i say is the, i think it's the most watched show of all yeah, time yeah. did you know how big that would be no because we, we did the first season in belfast or my bit of it was done in belfast and then i was out um in la doing something and that sounds really i was out in LA. Mm-hmm. anyway i was there i was doing uh, they asked me to do some ADR, you know, the sort of voice dubbing uh, on Game of Thrones. And uh, David Benioff and Dan Whites, the two guys that had written it and produced it, just young guys, you know, in their 30s. But they were there at the ADR, and we, we spent a morning or a day doing that. And I remember standing outside having a fag, and I, I said to them, um, you know, do you think we'll get a, another season out of this? And they actually said, I don't know, I don't know, we just got to wait and see. Maybe, maybe. And I'm thinking, no, oh, please, that'd be great. Wow. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. How could you? How That's could you know? I don't know. I know. Some people get a feeling like you said, when you got yeah. Braveheart, you know, about yeah. the train spot and yeah. Game of Thrones. Yeah. The, it's mad how life can just yeah. show you. Oh, You've geez. done the right thing, like you say. There's people, because I like to look at some actors who've rejected some film parts uh-huh. because they think nah shit and if other ones have kicked on and won Oscars and done yeah. that was there any parts that you rejected that you kind of regret <laughs> or did you know. take every part I don't know if I've rejected <laughs> any parts <laughs> yeah. you know if they pay me enough money I'm there <laughs> uh, uh, no not really No, I mean there's films I'd love to have been in you know but uh, uh, no I've, I've, I'm you know, I, I just take what comes along, and if it's a nice part, I'll say, yeah. You know, rejecting is like, you know, mm-hmm. um, no, that's not that's not my kind of movie or whatever. No, I don't do that. I just see what the character's like, you know. And I, to be honest, I've, I've I've always enjoyed working on on a variety of films. You know, like it's not like I want to be in bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger films. I mean, don't get me wrong, the money is very important it's money is very important to all of us Mm -hmm. and it's 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 terrific if you get something you think wow i'm actually getting paid a lot of money to do something i love but that's that's not really the the criteria in my life as as long as i've we've got enough to be getting on with i really love working with with um young filmmakers uh you know on on much lower budget movies because i've as you get older, I, I tend to sort of feed off their enthusiasm. You know, I see the the love of what they're doing, you know, the excitement that they've got making a film, you know? Mm-hmm. And that, that gives me a little bit of excitement. You know, I remember what it was like to be young and, and thinking, God, we're going to make this fantastic mm-hmm. film. And, oh, God, that scene was terrific. You know, sometimes you don't really get that in a big movie. You know, yeah. it's like a big business machine happening you've got to turn up and you've got to have your game face on don't screw it up just do the job and walk away you do know? you still get that obviously with Braveheart you're buzzing and you, you want to go at the premieres so even Game of Thrones popped as well when it became the biggest on the planet did you have that feeling or does that kind of fizzle like when Game of Thrones went as massive as yeah. it did did you have a feeling of it's a good feeling or because you're so used to it now, it doesn't feel the oh, same? No, no, no. I've, I've done plenty of films. You go, that should have been a success. It was shit. Anyway, it mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Um, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was great. I was, I was very happy to see that, that the incredible work that they'd done. And, and I think one of the main things was that George Martin's books, they 
really did justice to those books. And that's a hard thing to do, you know, to books that, especially those, those kind of books where a lot of the fans are really into that and they would pick up on anything uh, that was wrong or different uh, or not true to the characters. But they were, mm -hmm. those guys, but I think it's because they were huge fans. Both of them, David Benioff and Dan Wise, were huge fans of the books and they wanted to translate it perfectly into mm. that and yeah it worked is it just the same see for like braveheart it's all violence and swords troy to then santa claus and and narnia like yeah is it the same kind of setup and same day or is it more child relaxed because it's a kid's film or is it still as stressful no, it's, it's, it's all you know it's you know when that camera starts whirring that's dollar bills flying through there you know you don't want to be the guy that costs yeah a lot of money um so it's it's still stressful, but the 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 persona is obviously completely different. You know, like when you're doing, you know, like a, a battle scene or something like that. You've you've got yourself g'd up, you know, and you you're kidding yourself on that you're a tough guy and all that sort of stuff. But then you go off and you play Father Christmas, you know, and it's it's a different feeling because you realise that you know when they when they did that Narnia thing that he wasn't, Father Christmas wasn't like the Coca-Cola Santa Claus, you know, mm. the red and the cheeks and the white beard and all that. So, oh, 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 he wasn't that. You know, he was, he was the spirit of, of, of midwinter, but he was also the spirit of hope and things were going to be better. And if you just get the tools and you use them right, it's all going to work out, you know. So he was a, a really warm, compassionate he, he just symbolized love and faith and hope. And that's, it's a real privilege to play a part like that because you know that your audience are going to be children and they're going to be watching that. And I, I just felt, how lucky am I to play a character like that that little kids are going to look at and go, golly, that's Father Christmas. It's beautiful. And you know, that when I was, I can't remember, I, I was back in, because we shot that in New Zealand and I was only there for about three weeks or something. Anyway, when it came out, I can't remember, I, I was doing, I, I didn't have a great big beard or whatever, um, but I was, I was in Waitrose at the cheese counter. That shows you how posh I am, James. <laughs> Moved up the ladder. I was at Waitrose yeah. at, at their cheese counter. <clears throat> which is not cheap by any means. I, let me hear Waitrose and Marks and Spencers when you know you've made I know. that. Aye. <laughs> so I'm standing at the cheese counter and I, I was, you know, looking at cheese and uh, I, I, I sensed, you know, that way you can feel somebody looking at you, you know. And I, and I looked, there was a wee girl, she was about eight, maybe, something like that. Her mum must have been somewhere. But she's looking at me. Yeah. I went, hello. I went, yeah. So I'm looking at the cheese. And she, I looked back and she said, you're Father Christmas, aren't you? And I went, yeah. and she went, and she crept off, obviously to tell her mum that Father Christmas was at the cheese counter. Mm -hmm. So there's a girl who's about 30 now, that's someone in the back of my head. <laughs> I know I met Father Christmas at the cheese counter. Probably in some in <laughs> mental institute, aren't she? Running to her, I've seen Santa, I've seen Santa. Is, uh, was there any parts, like you said earlier, you wish you would have had, or you thought you could have played that part to a T? Uh, no, I, not really, no. Because I, I, I think... Uh, you, you you sometimes look at a, a character. I'll, I'll tell you a perfect example. My favourite piece of television, I think it's it's uh, astonishingly good on so many levels, is True Detective Season 1 with Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. I think it's the best piece of television of that genre that I've ever seen. The performances, the writing... The direction, ever the music is just perfect. And I remember going up and the my agent said, It's this thing through the I don't know what it is. Um, but it's playing this guy who puts on sort of English voices and he's he's actually American, but he's a weird guy. We didn't know much about it, you know. And I went up and the, the, you just had a couple of pages and I read it, and I didn't get it. Um but then when I saw the show and I saw the guy, 
And the guy did a terrific job. I couldn't have been anywhere near him. But I thought, how cool would that have been to, to be in the show that you later think, that's the best piece of television I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. But it didn't happen. But again, you know, that guy did a fantastic job. He was perfect for it. And, uh, you know, you like to think, I could have done that. Well, you know, maybe you could. But that's, you know, subjective. What makes a good actor? Um... I think the willingness to open your heart and your soul to that character and not to be uh, afraid to show the deepest of emotions, uh, no, no barriers between you and the camera. It's just gotta be from there to there. That's, I think that's it. How hard is it to bring emotion to the camera? Uh, I think that the, the better written the part, not the easier, but um, the more apparent that character is. Um, I, I did a film, it was a, a, a one-man film, that sounds terribly arrogant. It, it, it was, I met this guy called Jeff Thompson. Now, you will know Jeff Thompson. Oh, Jeff, the karate guy. Eight done. Mad. And the rest. Aye, one of the biggest killers on the planet. And Great guy. I love Jeff. He's a remarkable, remarkable. <clears throat> Unbelievable story. Yes, it is. It is. It's um, extraordinary. Anyway, that's interesting you know Jeff. Yeah, he's been on the show. Has he? Yeah. Unbelievable podcast. Oh, jeez. From what he's went through as a kid and yeah. the oh. pain, the struggle. Yeah. I think it was the bouncer. Or what, what was it? That's right, yeah. Yeah, the doorman. The doorman. The doorman. Some book, yeah, he yeah. gave me his books, but Jeff's story was he was abused by his sensei or his master or yeah. somebody who was teaching him and couldn't abuse them. But Jeff ended up training himself to be one of the biggest killers on the planet, became a doorman and full yeah. of violence and hate yeah. and rage. He calls it the parasite. Yeah. The parasite kept getting bigger because I never faced it. Yeah. <clears throat> so he became an eighth dan or a ninth dan and he seen his abuser in the in like a cafe. But this guy's been planning and killing this guy for years and he kind of froze, mm. but then he approached him and then he kind of took his power back. And then since then, he kind of flourished in life. He's wrote so many books. I think he's, bath he's won BAFTAs. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable man and unbelievable podcast, Jeff. Yeah. He contacted us a few months ago as well. I think he's got a new book out. Oh, great. Well, I met Jeff, uh, the two, two directors, the Shemesian brothers, and they'd wanted to do something with me. And they said that Jeff had wanted to do something with me. And it was a like low to no budget movie, right? Um, so I met with Jeff and we met at the Soho house, you know? Um, anyway, I don't really suit the Soho house. We'd, we'd tea, we started off with tea uh, in the afternoon. We, I think we were there for about eight hours. We we're just talking to each other, just talking a bit. And the conversation got deeper and deeper and deeper. And he was talking to me about his life and I was talking to him about my life and the, the anxieties and the, the traumas and everything. We just opened our hearts to each other. It was extraordinary, eight hours. So flash forward to about six months after that and I was filming in Tenerife. Annie and the boys were with me came home one night from filming and there's an email from the Shemesian brothers with an attachment of um, uh, this film called The Pyramid Texts. So they said, would you read this and get back to us? And uh, so I started to read it. I got a third of the way through. I had to stop. Oh, this is too, too much for me. This is awful. Not awful, it was just emotionally, it was like, oh Christ. So it took me three, I read it in three bits, eventually get through. It was like a boxing match, you know, I was just exhausted reading it. I was just like emotionally drained. I thought, I oh, can't do this. No, I couldn't. No. So I went away and I worked a few days in the film and things, this thing, back of my head. And then I thought, Meh. Maybe it's one of those things you've got to say, no, I've got to do this. I've got to, I can do it. 
you've got to do it. So I put some stuff on, I, I did a, an audio thing for them about how I thought it, it might be. I did an American, it's about a film about an old boxing trainer. He comes in, it, we shot it at Repton Boys Club. He comes into the ring and he sets up a camera like that and sits down, he starts sitting in the stool in the middle of the ring, starts talking stuff. And it's just 94 minutes of him talking to the camera, talking to whoever, what he's going to leave behind. And yeah, so it's a long thing. And Jeff had written this incredible script, just incredible. But we're talking about how hard is it to get into this emotional thing? Well, there's a scene or there's a part of the film at the very end. And it was like, it was like a train coming down a tunnel. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. I knew all this horror was coming towards me, but you just had to wait for it. And because it was so beautifully written and it was such an intimate thing, it just came like that, boom, there it is. Mm -hmm. There he is. See, when you do that and bring that emotion or, yeah. or see that, even in films, I know people can go down that route of Daniel Day-Lewis and the method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of lose herself. Yeah. See, when you've had a mad day and you see like killing scenes or violence, can it play an effect on your mind yeah, yeah, when you go yeah. home? Yeah, yeah. I remember doing a, a thing called Silent Witness. You know the, the mm -hmm. uh, Alicia Fox, uh, uh, is that her name? Um, you know, about a forensic scientist um, about dead things. Anyway, they, they asked me to uh, play this serial killer who abducted and tortured and killed young girls Fuck. and I remember I went okay now I remember I said that I didn't do any research I don't know how a serial killer what what I don't know anything about that so I got through a friend of mine I met two detectives one was retired and one had retired and they brought him back because he they were that that's what they did you know if somebody had killed someone and they thought hang on this was this the first one or whatever? These were the guys that, that could get them, get it out of them. You know, they psychologically, they were very informed on what a serial killer was and how to operate that. So two separate meetings with them. And in both of the meetings, I asked them, is there something like a hook that I can hang on to? I said, what is there about a serial killer? And both of them said, nothing, nothing. They said he can be quiet and meek and f tiny and frail, it can be huge, it can be aggressive. He said, you cannot tell. You just cannot tell. It's just one thing in there that's different, but they could be any person walking down that street, any male walking down that street. Could be anything. I thought, fuck, that's not the thing. How, how, how am I gonna find this guy? Anyway, you know, I was talking about subliminal things, mm -hmm. you know, you I have a great belief that your subconscious does so much more work than your conscious brain. You know, that's just like a fucking frog. Mm -hmm. But the subconscious is doing all the, the heavy lifting. Anyway, I've read this script, read it a couple of times. And I'm, I think I'm, it's getting closer and closer to start filming. And I remember phoning uh, Christian Solomeno, who's a, a very close friend of mine, an actor, a young actor. Or he's not young now. Christ, he's nearly 50. But anyway... I phoned him and I said, I've got no idea who this character, I don't know who he is. I've got no idea of his accent or anything. I'm fucking filming it in the morning and I don't, I know the lines and everything, but I don't know who the character is. I, this is fucking, uh. so I turn up in the morning. I'm still like, what? I go into the makeup trailer. I'm really early. I go into the makeup trailer and he's being caught and He's been interrogated and all that sort of stuff. So I'm sitting there and I'm talking with a makeup girl, you know, and she put, I said, could you put on some like prison tattoos, you know, like, like rubbish things, you know, just like dots and things like that. And then I said, I had a, had a beard like this and I said, could you put extensions in the beard and maybe plait them? Because I was thinking, you know, when you, you get banged up, all Everything is taken away from you. Any freedom is taken away from you. So you, you have to find something where you can say, this is me, you know, so I can tattoo, I can do that. You know, I can make myself look a bit weird with, with 
plaited beards and weird stuff. And I was looking and looking. And I, I swear to you, this character just walked into my head. He just fucking walked in like that, like a, like a fucking ghost behind me. And I knew his accent. I knew everything about him. I knew the latent violence. I knew his intellectual prowess. You know, he was obsessed by Milton's Paradise Lost. You know, he knew it by heart, the whole thing. I knew how deeply his brain had gone into this weird fucking world. So for two weeks, I played that character and it took me a couple of weeks to get away from him yeah. until he fucked off out my brain. Because I watched, was it Man on the Moon? I think it was Jim Carrey who played Andy Hoffman. Uh -huh. He was close to getting kicked off his set because he'd done the method thing where it became him. Yeah. But it became yeah. so annoying that the producer could, he was smashing up shit because he just went right into character before yeah. filming, during filming. And I've got a yeah. mad, he, yeah. he went mad, yeah. Jim. And I, I, I think maybe when, when you have, maybe it's because, maybe actors in a way do not have a, a or a lot of actors don't have a very um, concrete idea of themselves. You know, they don't, they're not like, this is me, you know, this is how I am and that's it. Maybe we're a bit more fragile that way or a bit more open. And when something comes along that's very powerful, like, you know, when Daniel Day-Lewis played Hamlet and, and you know, was mm -hmm. so deeply into it, he saw his father and he never walked on stage again. But maybe we make ourselves available to, to much more powerful characters that we're playing. And that can be dangerous. Yeah, that is dangerous yeah. because I know a lot of comedians and they're all fucked in the head, every single one, every comedian I know. I love them to bits, but yeah. on stage, there, there's something else. After stage, they're kind of lost. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. see that with actors as well? Yeah, I do. I do. Not all actors, but, you know, you, you get um, actors who they are. John Wayne, you know, that's John Wayne. He doesn't play anything else. He just plays that. But people mm -hmm. that, that really act and inhabit characters yeah i can see them you know that's why a lot of them drink so much and you know behave in strange ways maybe it's because the, the their character isn't you know as as solid as it could be yeah because the brain's a powerful tool we know this and, yeah 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 and if you're creating different the brain doesn't know what's real or what's fake so no, if you're creating certain true. things yeah. It, yeah. it can yeah. mentally scar you yeah did you struggle after that part no, for just, a couple just, of weeks just, just for a couple of weeks she just thought i wish i I didn't keep thinking about that, you know, and yeah. seeing the things, uh, you know, because he clip her thing, you know, pinch her things with kids' fingers. Mm. And you think, oh, fuck it. You know, I want a shower, yeah. you know, I want him to go away, you know, and it did eventually, yeah. How do you handle nerves? Um, badly. Uh, if you don't have nerves, that's a really bad sign for an actor. You know, if, if you're not, if you don't get that, hopefully it's just butterflies in your stomach. That's quite a pleasant feeling, you know. Um, it's, it's not, having nerves is not anything that you can say, I now know how to control this. Because every time is, it's brand new, you go, oh Christ, I'm so nervous about doing this. But when that camera starts rolling and they go, action, it's those nerves that go and become adrenaline and you give a performance. You know, if you, if you don't have that, if you are so relaxed and cool, you know, you're not going to give the performance you should do. You need that adrenaline. You need that thing and that not specifically showing it, but you need your, your body to be, to be tingling with anticipation of playing that character. What's the longest scene you've ever done? Oh, it have to be the pyramid text. What was 94 that? minutes. Just talking to a camera? Just talking to a camera. But you know when you're talking about nerves, when I started on uh, Troy, we did a, a few days in uh, uh, Shepparton. Uh, this big set was a big temple, you know, and uh, it was where the Trojans were 
shouting some fucking anyway there's full of people and Eric Banner was there and, and uh, Peter O'Toole was there uh, and I've got this speech but I can't remember but Troy and we're gonna beat the fuck out of it anyway I'm, I'm oh dear I'm in a terrible state first day you know like huge set you think oh I really need this it's all a bit intimidating you know so we, we do it and we, we do the scene and we break for lunch and I'm walking back and uh, Peter O'Toole's walking beside me. And I said, oh, I said, Peter, I can't tell you how nervous I was this morning. And Peter said, Christ, he said, you are fucking nervous. I thought, you're Peter O'Toole. You've won Oscars and all sorts. He was as nervous as I was. That's just the way it is. I love to watch the bloopers on it. I'm the kind of oh, guy that goes to school, yeah. uh, goes to bed at night and I'll put on the bloopers and I'll, I'll just, I like to see people fucking up and just owning it and laughing at it. Oh. Is there any times where you've just lost it and you oh. just let go with the oh. laughter? Many times. <laughs> <laughs> corpsing. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm really scared of corpsing mm -hmm. because once it gets hold of you, whatever the fucking hell it is, it just, oh dear. It just grabs hold of you. I remember I was doing Roughnecks, right, which was set out in the North Sea. And there was this scene we were doing, you know, you do one bit out, outside the room and then the reverse. So the reverse is me and Ricky Tomlinson is there. And I just open the door and all the guys are outside and I say, it's sorted. That's all of it. That. that is simple, right? We've been doing it for ages. I was so relaxed and things, it was fine. So they said, right, action. Like that. And I'm standing with Ricky. And just before I started walking, Ricky went, oh. <laughs> 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 Open the door. It's, I'm sorry, sorry. Can we go again? <laughs> and Ricky said, sorry. Uh, it's all right. No, it's fine. Action. <laughs> they had to cancel the filming for the day I could not speak I couldn't speak I, went, I would just open the door and I was just crying all the time and that's because people get annoyed they think no come on be professional mm -hmm. so that's why I'm frightened of it mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think it's amazing that because it's like back in the day when you're at school and his teachers used to shout tell you to shut up my head would just fucking go. Yeah. I would always get put out because it would last 10, 20 minutes, yeah. man. And then I would think about it the next day sometimes and i think, fuck me. I was watching the snooker and a guy farted. <laughs> and it's so, it's so immature. What, one of the players? Yeah, no, oh, one one of somebody in the chair. It was Judge, <laughs> Judge Trump was just a bit high, And he farted and I couldn't just don't fucking... And I, and I felt no. like a child. No. I felt like a baby. No. And they, then the players started laughing and then I would go again. Oh, and then I, kept, yeah. I had to keep being <laughs> right that somebody oh, farted. that's wonderful. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I did a, I did a thing. I, I love, uh, you know, farting is awfully funny. It can be awfully funny. And I was doing this thing. It was um, what was it called, Soldier Soldier? And I'm playing the the Lieutenant Colonel of the regiment, and he's he's been court-martialed, right? And uh, uh, it's a really serious scene. Uh, so you've got all these officers there, and this I'm playing this officer who's been court-martialed and things, and. Um, I just got one of these, you know, these electronic fart machines, mm -hmm. right? You've got a wee button and then you've got the box. So I had the box in my, the back of my trousers pinned on there. Um, so I said to the director, I said, you see, well, cause I'm making this speech to the, to the, the, the court in my defense. And it's really, men have been shot and all that. So, oh fuck. Um, I said to the director, you see, when you've got this, when you know, you've got everything you need, I said, if I nod to you, can you say, let's go again? He went, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I've got the thing. So we've done the scene. It's all, all done. And I, they said, I went, yeah. he went, right, well, just, just go one more for safety on that, please. I went, right, okay. So I've got this thing, man. <laughs> These poor fucking actors. <laughs> what a terrible thing to do to people. <laughs> I said, uh, Officers of the court. <laughs> <laughs> and I could see these guys going. <laughs> I say, I was right. In my defense, I would say it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they give all sorts of different 
yeah. farts, you know, yeah. like little ones, big <laughs> little ones. And I did the whole scene. And these actors, they were just dying. They were dying. I could see all their eyes were red and filled with tears. Mm -hmm. And some of them were shaking. The sound man is going. <laughs> and then when they said, cut like that, the sound man went over to the director. <laughs> It's <laughs> great stuff. I yeah. loved it. It's good man, because there's a lot of pressure on actors. A lot of people don't realise like the three AM call times and the craft oh, geez, that goes yeah. into it. It's yeah. hours and hours that yeah. goes into yeah. that craft. And it's good to because when you see a film and you see a series film, but then you see them laughing at the bloopers that yeah. it kinda yeah. just go out. It, yeah, it's, it's wonderful it's when fucking, it breaks the ice yeah. like that. Yeah. Who's the greatest actor you've ever worked with? Ever worked with? Um Oh Jings, that's a that's a, a a really difficult one. Um, I would have to take that in advisement, James. I'll send you an email. Mm -hmm. there's, Too hard. There's, there's none that, that um, uh, stick out. I mean, uh, you know, actors that, I've, that I wish I'd worked with, you know, like Peter Finch. People like that. Oh, Jeez, what an actor. Just fabulous, mm -hmm. fabulous actors. But there's so many of them, you know. And I, I've, I've been hugely privileged to, you know, Pat McGowan. What a fabulous actor. What a fabulous man. You know, it was a privilege to work with him, to, to be in the same film as him. Your dad must have been proud of you. I don't know. Why? I don't know. We didn't get on too well. Oh, did you not? No. Nah. No. Nah. No, nah, I was a bit of a dick, you know. You joined the club, mate. Yeah. You know, like, you do lots of things wrong. Mm -hmm. And you go down that path and, you you know, people lose... You know, it just, yeah, just, uh, we just didn't go on that great, which is a shame. But he was of that age. He was that type of person. You know, he was a fighting man. He was, you know, he was a, he was a tough guy. Um, that's just the way it was. Yeah, you know? back then it wasn't. I think if he's looking down on me now, he'd say, yeah, you did okay. You know, yeah. but, um, Yeah. But back then it wasn't, I'm proud of you, it was okay, it was get up, like boys don't cry, that kind of mentality, all that, all that tough stuff. mentality, but all then that, stuff. that yeah. kind of lays out your life and makes you a bit something to go, keeps you a bit tough, even though, listen, we live in an environment where it's very soft, we live in a weekend oh, generation absolutely. where yeah, yeah. we can mother too much. And the thing is, it's not their fault, Yeah, it's not their fault, it's because, our fault. Yeah. yeah, is that how you're s close to your own kids now? Yeah, I... I, I, I I, I try and fail often to be the, the best father I can, but I know that, that sometimes um, the love of your children, if it's not regulated by the fact that you're their father, not their best friend, you know, you've, you're there to set an example and to instill some kind of discipline into them and self-discipline for them. And to make them aware of that and bring them up as men, I've, I've, yeah, hopefully I can do that. I've yeah, done that. Yeah, it's important because you spoke about having your babies next to you when they're born. Because you used to have the cry out method where kids used to scream and it was self bollocks. serving. The kids Utter have got bollocks. to be skin to skin and I believe in the like, natural and keeping them there because it, yeah. they say self serving. But that, I, I then think that creates abandonment issues as I'm learning over the years. And I feel as if the more love you can give your kids the more they'll thrive in life because they don't feel abandoned, they don't feel lonely. Absolutely, it's the most yeah. natural thing in the world that a, a child cries, why it's crying. Any animal cries, why it needs its parents there, mm -hmm. you know? Both, both my kids slept with us whenever they felt like it and then went to their own bed when they wanted to. I wish Ethan had waited till he hadn't lived until he was 25 <laughs> before he moved out. But, <laughs> but no, I think it's, it's you know, it's, it's wonderful. For, and, you know, it's wonderful. For, I remember talking to a, uh, somebody, a doctor, I think, uh, Dr. Momick, and I was talking about that. And I, I said, but, you know, what if, you know, you've got your baby in there. What if you roll over on them? He said, you'll never roll over on them. He said, if, if you're asleep, you, you know, you just won't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. You won't smother your child. You're, you're too much together. Senses. You know? And that, you smell them and they smell you. And they know they're loved and safe and comforted. What's wrong with that? Yeah. What is wrong with that? Senses. What, you're going to put them in a room somewhere and say, oh, wait till they stop crying and they'll be fine. Aye, that's going to sort you out great in future. Yeah, wait till they're 18. Absolutely. Yeah, and they, and yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. What's the greatest part you feel as if you've ever played or the one you've enjoyed the most? Uh, I think there's 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 a, a difference between um, the the best part you've played and the one you've enjoyed most. Because sometimes, like the pyramid text, I think that was the best effort I could ever give as an actor with my talent. Mm -hmm. You know, meager as it is, that's the best I could do. Um, but it wasn't particularly pleasant or, you know, because you had to dig deep, as we're talking about, into your soul and, mm -hmm. and open yourself out, you know. But then you do something like Jack Ryan, and I had a, an absolute ball doing that. It, you know, John Krasinski plays Jack Ryan, you know, they've done three seasons uh, and uh, four seasons. And I was in season three playing this Russian spy master. Spy. Was that what you were talking about, Steph? Yeah. Because yeah. you never had a beard or a moustache, so he didn't I know. know it was you. I know. I didn't know it was me. Mm -hmm. when, they, I, 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 when I arrived, they said um, in Budapest, mm -hmm. I tell you, see, when I went to Budapest, I mean, Budapest is a stunning place. Hungary itself is a fabulous country with fabulous people. Anyway, I arrived there. Well, I'll tell you the story how I got it. Of course. I get a call, like on a Friday or something, and it's my agent, Olivia, and she says, um, James, she said, I've had a phone call about you from um, the producers of Jack Ryan. I went, uh, she said, it's an Amazon thing with John Krasinski. Now, I hadn't watched... Um, What's it called? The Office. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen the American version, um, which John was in. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't really know who that was. And she said, it's really odd because usually if you're going up for a, like a, I mean, it's a huge Amazon scene, the most expensive one they've got. It's enormous. But it was, they're finished now. I mean, tens of millions of pounds every episode. It's crazy. Um, and she said, you know, usually you have to go through different levels. You know, you got up, and it's a really, really big part. And you, you, you know, you got to pass different sort of gates to get through. Mm -hmm. She said, "It's, it's a straight offer. They just want you." She said, "The, the producers want you, the studio wants you, uh, and Amazon want you. But most importantly, John Krasinski wants you." I thought, "What, John Krasinski?" What? Anyway, she says, uh, yeah, and this is the deal. And it's like, wow, wow. So I said, yeah, absolutely. Cut forward a wee bit. The first day I meet John Krasinski, who's a delightful man, great big guy. He's really lovely. And we we're, were talking and he said, do you know uh, why we asked you to play this part? I said, John, I would love to know. I was, I was waiting to, like, I don't understand. He said, my wife and I were reading season three. His wife is Emily Blunt, the act, fabulous actress, right? She said, we were reading the, the season three together. And uh, we came, came to the end of it. And he, he, he said, I said to my wife, who should play Luka Gotcharov? And Emily said, without hesitation, James Cosmo. Now, I've never met Emily Blunt Still haven't in my life. Never met her. But that lady said, he should play it. And John said, I agree. That was it. Boom. Done. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Anyway, I, I turn up, I fly into Budapest and uh, go for a costume fitting. They pick me up at the airport, go straight to the studio, costume fitting. So that's like an hour, no less, 40 minutes. Try on the suits because they're all dark suits, Russian suits. I go and get in the car, drive to my hotel, right? The Four Seasons, James, The Four Seasons, right? It's like the best, beautiful, just overlooking the Danube. It's like, oh my God. And I walk in, I think this is the bollocks, I'm right here. So I go up to my room, I haven't even unpacked and the phone rings. So I answer the phone, hello. And they said, James, I said, yeah, that's right. They said, it's production here. Um, when you're at the costume fitting today, um, someone was later tested for COVID and they've tested positive for COVID. So you are now confined to your room for two weeks. <laughs> what? <laughs> they went, right, that's... I said, what? I've, I've got to stay in the hotel. They said, no, you have to stay in your room. You're not allowed out your room. 
And it was funny because your mind changes. One minute you're thinking, this is just <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Every bed, the fucking TV, everything. Mm -hmm. In 10 seconds you're going, fuck. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Is this it? And it was two weeks. You would you would phone up. I went through the room service menu about four times. You'd go, send us up one mm -hmm. of those steaks again, would you? And But then they'd ring the doorbell, and you'd run over to the door, open the door. There's nobody there. It's like The Shining. <laughs> it was just a trolley <laughs> with your food on. They must have, like, <laughs> there's a trolley. Ready? Bring all this. <laughs> so I didn't uh, see anybody for two weeks. Mm -hmm. It was it was hell. It was like being in solitary. How have you managed to stay at the top of your game through the years? Uh, because you see people who do a couple of big parts and fade away. You seem to have improved as you've got older. But the two Well, there was a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I started with a very low bar. And then worked my way up, but um, I'm only halfway. Um, I think it's just been open to stuff, James. You know, like I won't say no. Just you know, like I've done. I, I did a Bollywood movie. Yeah, I did. Where's that? Where can see? We see that? Oh, I'm not going to tell you. Tell is mate. I'm oh. going to cut up clips oh. and say this is a real James Cosmo. I tell you, it was. It was. How was that? It'd have been fun. It was mad. Yeah. It was absolutely mad because they they all came over uh, to London to this huge crew, right? Um, so we filmed in London, and then, I, then I went out to Chennai uh, for about a week uh, to do bits out there. But uh, well, I worked with this, he's a really famous Indian actor called Danush, and he was a lovely young man, and uh, like a, a superstar out there. But um, we, we did, you know, I, I said to them at the beginning, I said, I don't have to sing, do I? And they went, no, no, no singing, don't worry. Because it's all singing and dancing. I, the character, you know, he doesn't sing. I went, oh, well, that's okay then. But I thought, this is going to be interesting, how people on another continent make movies. I want to be part of that. So I did. But eventually we were down in Rochester or somewhere filming, and me and Danush have just, it's just a gangster thing, and I've just killed, stabbed this guy to death, you know, and I've got blood all over me. And we get out this Rolls Royce, and they start playing. It wasn't Indian music, but it was it was some sort of rock and roll song. I made the new <laughs> singing this song. You think, what's going on? Uh -huh. But you just got to go with it, you uh -huh. know. And it was it was interesting. So just being open to to different things and trying different things, see what it's like. Hmm. You know, there's nothing wrong in trying, and to try and keep your enthusiasm for for the industry and for life and for just just keep open and keep enth be enthusiastic about mm -hmm. it because we're only here for a very short time and and just enjoy it give give it your best what's your proudest moment in life james uh my proudest moments i don't know i don't know the birth of my children but i was absent at both thank god <laughs> um it was a a terrific piece of timing. Um, I was away for both of them. Um, I don't. I don't think you can say I'm proud uh, to have become a father. I mean, it didn't take much, um, especially me. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's that's that's been the greatest joy of my life. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I find it hard to think of a. Uh, the, the 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 greatest moments in my life um uh nothing you know you can say i get the the mbe um from the queen uh which was which was delightful and i was so glad to to meet her albeit very very briefly you know like she goes well done and then she shakes her hand like that and then she goes fuck off <laughs> <laughs> okay um yeah that's it um no i'm i'm uh I, I, can i say it's i'm 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 sort of satisfied with the way my life has panned out i don't think there's anything that i should be particularly proud of because i haven't done anything that that deserves a great deal of pride um I'd like to think my family are, are happy with what I've done and that, that, that's enough for me. Do you think you're hard on yourself a lot? 
because what you've achieved from a Scotsman from coming from Claybank is second to none. There's only a handful, handful of people who have done what you've done, the career that you've had. It's unbelievable. And for me, sitting across from you, I'm proud, man, to say, <laughs> because as a Scotsman as well, it's, it's amazing to see because I know how hard the industry is to try and make something of your life and do what others don't push on to do. So you've left the blueprint for people that can go on and achieve their dreams, you know? Well, that's that's very generous of you to say so, James. But the the only thing that 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 I'm, I might be proud of, I, I, I'm wary of the word proud. But if we're going to use that, if I'm I'm proud, I would I, I take pride in the fact that people, ordinary, working people, can look at me and look at my my work and say he's one of us because I am, and I've never wanted to be anything else but one of them. I am not elevated in any way. I'm one of you, and that's what I'm proud of. Yeah, fair play. You won the Great Scotsman Award? The Great Scot Award? Uh, yeah, uh, Lifetime Achievement Lifetime, Award. Yeah. You won the Lifetime Achievement yeah. Award. Which is a bit worrying, you know, because they say Lifetime Achievement. What, is that it over? Mm -hmm. See you I'm later. Now. <laughs> like, am I going to work again? Uh, um, uh -huh. But yeah, I... I I won that about five or six years ago. And then I gave Bobby's one, which he so, so richly deserves. Yeah, definitely. See, before we finish up, where was yeah. Braveheart filmed? Where was it? Where was uh, it? All over. Can you talk about it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it wasn't always Scotland. It no, was Ireland. It was all over the place. We went up to um, Inverness mm -hmm. and we filmed in uh, 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 just outside Inverness for about, five weeks all the the mountainous stuff was scotland and then michael d higgins who was then the irish minister of culture is now the president of ireland he got in touch with the production company and said if you come to ireland we will give you uh tax breaks we'll give you the the territorial army no fly zones all that sort of stuff you know so it, it was a no-brainer for the production company, but I was, it was great. To, and I love Ireland, and I, I play Irishman quite a lot, and I, 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 I feel so at home in Ireland. But I just thought, why? You know, because you saw that that thing of a like like a pebble in the, the the pool. You know, that money that was spent in Scotland. You could see people that, you know, they they they'd made some money, so they bought. You know, they had their kitchen redone and all that. So you thought, God, if 80 million pounds was spent here, it'd be fantastic, you know? And that's what, you know, I, I tried to, myself and Dave Stewart, the, you know, the Eurythmics guy, we tried to build a studio up there, but it didn't work. And uh, I lost a lot of money doing that. But um, I just, yeah, I just... Uh, was a bit saddened that it wasn't all filmed in Scotland, but there you are. It was, yeah, that's what it is, it was. yeah. What's your plans for the future, James? Uh, I'll just, uh, I think I'm playing, shows how old I am. I think I'm playing Merlin in yet another King Arthur film at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of looking forward to that. That'll be a bit of fun. For anybody that's watching, because I know people will see, they see people on the big screens and they think, wow, they must be fucking living the high life. But... A lot of actors, you know yourself, struggling. I know you've been through some struggles in life. Yeah. For anybody that's watching that's maybe in this struggle, James, what advice would you have for them? If if you're in the acting world. In any world. Well, not in, just in our own life in general. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could say something really profound and helpful to people, but I, in my, my later years of, of uh, I... I I have found a belief in in something greater than us, and I do believe that um, uh, that everything will turn out okay. In the end, we just have to try and display um, kindness and love and strength uh, in the world, and be brave and be steadfast and embrace the values that really mean things and that's not envy and money and everything else those don't mean anything it's who you are as a person and even if you go to your grave with nothing at least you've lived your life as 
a good person. That's it. James, boy, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, that's fine. That's an absolute legend, Scottish it's been legend. A real pleasure. Yeah, Thank no, you, likewise, man. I wish you all the best for the future, and I look forward to see what you do next. And I, I look forward to watching many more of your podcasts. Thank you, my brother. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs>